Robert Ryan was physically and mentally pushed to his limits for his part in Day of the Outlaw. Ryan gave one of the most intense performances of his career as the tough rancher Blaze Starrett. The movie was shot in the bitter cold of Oregon's desert. But the actor had a hard time because of the rough conditions on set and problems in his personal life. What started out as just another tough western turned into an event that would change my life and have an effect that would last a lifetime. How did making this movie cost him so much? Robert Ryan had an exciting life before he ever stepped in front of a camera. Ryan was born in Chicago in 1909 and grew up in a quiet Catholic home. He wasn't a kid who liked to do nothing. He was always moving, he was full of life and determined, and those traits would later shape his future. In his younger years, he lived like he was looking for a reason to live. He didn't know where he fit but was ready to do anything to find out. He did try. He worked on a ranch and even lit fires on a ship that took him to faraway places like Africa. It was a life full of dirt, sweat, and hard work. He went to Dartmouth College, which is an Ivy League school. You might think of the place as being full of books and serious professors, but Ryan wasn't just interested in that. The heavyweight boxing title was his for all four years, and he was a force in the fight. He could use his anxious energy in this way and test himself in a way that studying couldn't, but things weren't simple or clear after college. He did many things that were just as hard on his body as his time in the ring. The Works Progress Administration WPA was a government scheme during the Great Depression that tried to get people back to work. It was hard to make ends meet, so Ryan, like many others, took what he could get. He ended up on a ranch in Montana, getting his hands dirty and living a rough life that might have seemed very different from the glitz and glitter of Hollywood. Whenever he chose to try acting for the first time in 1937, everything changed. The move was risky, but Ryan wasn't afraid to take a chance. He had a deal with Paramount Pictures by late 1939. Once Ryan signed with a big company like Paramount, you'd think he'd become famous right away, but it wasn't the case. He got his start in acting in a fighting movie. Given his past, it's not too much of a stretch, but it wasn't good enough to make anyone happy. Two more small roles in westerns were given to him by Paramount. The Texas Rangers and the Northwest Mounted Police are back on the move. You would have to squint to see him in both movies. If you didn't blink, that is. He played a Mountie in one part and an uncredited citizen with a pencil-thin mustache in the other. It was almost a start. Ryan wasn't going to give up, even with these small parts. It was hard to make it in Hollywood, and he knew that it wouldn't happen quickly. He took his skills to Broadway in the hopes that the stage would give him the break he was looking for. It did, in a way. Many people didn't know him after his time in New York, but it did bring him to the attention of people who could help his business. By 1943, Ryan had moved to RKO Pictures, which was known for making noirs and dark movies. He kept getting better during his time there. It all began with a part in The Sky's the Limit, where he played Fred Astaire's friend. He was able to show a bit more of his range in this different type of part. Before Ginger Rogers' role in Tender Comrade, though, not many people paid much attention to him. The movie was a hit, and Ryan became a bigger star thanks to Edward Demetrik's direction. But just as things were getting heated in Hollywood, WWI, I broke out. Ryan joined the military like a lot of young guys his age did. He served in the US from 1944 to 1945. Marines, he wasn't just doing his job when he was in the service. It also helped him make friends for life, like the writer and director Richard Brooks, who would become an important person in Ryan's life and work. During this time, Ryan also started drawing, a quiet hobby that might have come as a surprise to someone who looks so tough on the outside. Once the war was over, Ryan went back to acting, but this time he got bigger parts. The first Western movie he really liked was Trail Street, which came out in 1947 and starred Randolph Scott. The part wasn't very exciting, though. Alan Harper, the character he played, was a kind-hearted businessman who helped Kansas farmers fight against greedy ranchers. At the time, it was a common story. Ryan plays the good guy who gets caught up in a lot of problems. But something wasn't there. Ryan had too much going on for him to play a simple good guy. Ryan had his big break that same year, but it wasn't in a Western. It was in Crossfire, which was another project with director Edward Dimitrik. The movie was a noir thriller, and Ryan played a killer who was anti-Semitic. The part was so scary and powerful that it got him nominated for an Academy Award for Best Supporting Character. Crossfire worked out well. For Ryan, it opened up new doors, but not always the ones he was hoping for. He didn't get to play leading men in popular movies very often. Instead, he was cast as bad guys, which he did surprisingly well. But westerns kept coming. For Return of the Bad Men in 1948, he worked with Randolph Scott again. But this time, Ryan played the Sundance Kid, which was very different from his earlier role as a good guy. 
the movie put together a group of criminals, to Billy the Kid and the Dalton boys in between. The best part of the show, though, was how Ryan played Sundance. He was cruel, cold, and had a plan. A half hour of screen time was all it took for him to kill an innocent Indian, choke the main character, and shoot his partner in the back. It was scary, dark, and completely riveting. Ryan's full ability as a Western bad guy was shown for the first time. After that, Ryan was known for playing guys who were on the edge of being good or evil, or who just picked the wrong side. In 1951's Best of the Bad Men, his next Western, he played a tough but good guy, which was a bit of a step back. The movie had a great cast, including Bruce Cabot, Walter Brennan, and Robert Preston, but it wasn't the best thing Ryan ever did. The story was hard to follow, and Ryan's part as a good guy wasn't as scary as his scary roles. When he got the lead role in Horizons West the next year, things got better again. Ryan played the bad guy Dan Hammond in the movie, which was directed by Bud Bodicher. Hammond wants to build an empire no matter what it takes. Ryan was so intense on screen that he made big names like Rock Hudson and James Artis look weak in comparison. He was playing a character with dangerous goals, which was where he belonged. Someone who was ready to lie to family and friends to get what he wanted. Ryan moved to MGM around this time, and two of his most famous Western parts came with it. One was in 1953's The Naked Spur, where he played Ben Vandergroot, a schemer who was being chased by James Stewart's character. The movie was like a high-stakes game of cat and mouse, and it was set in rough mountains. It was tight and exciting, and Ryan's performance as Vandergroot was very scary. Everyone could feel the danger in every word he said. People could say that The Naked Spur was his best Western, and they'd be right. You might have thought that Robert Ryan's Western career was over after The Naked Spur. But then Day of the Outlaw came out in 1959, and it was clear that Ryan had one more part that would make his career and life forever different. Day of the Outlaw, which was directed by Andre de Toth, was a Western like no other. It took place in the snowy forests of Wyoming and was about a small town that was under attack by a group of bad guys led by Burl Ives' scary character. The players were just as important to the movie as the weather. The biting cold and snowstorms made the characters feel alone and hopeless. Ryan, who played Blaze Starrett, was in the middle of it all a tough rancher who was eager to keep the bad guys out of his town. Ryan had never played a hero like Sturrett before. Even though he was the good guy, there was nothing soft about him. He wasn't the well-groomed sheriff or the brave cowboy. Sturrett was tough, rough, and rude. He wasn't saving the town because he felt it was the right thing to do. He was only interested in staying alive, and he would do anything to do that. Ryan was so good at the part that I couldn't take my eyes off of him. You could tell that every choice he made was important to him. He didn't say much, but you could see his mind working as he tried to figure out how to protect his people from the gang. It showed how to be strong and pay attention in a quiet way. It was a beautiful movie. Russell Harlan's black and white cinematography made every harsh line in the snowy scenery stand out. It was so cold that it almost got through the screen, and the players' faces showed it, especially Ryan's. But the mood of Day of the Outlaws was what really made it stand out. It was easy to feel the stress in the town. As the bad guys took over, you could feel the fear and confusion. Ryan Sturrett was put in charge of a town that was about to be destroyed, which was an odd choice. The story was based on a book by Lee Edwin Wells that came out in 1955. Producer Buddy Adler bought the film rights for Robert Wagner in the beginning. But when everything came together, it was clear that Robert Ryan was the only person who could have played Sturrett. There were some problems with Philip Jordan's writing, but it was tight and on point. In the end, Jordan said that the sum wasn't enough to make the movie he wanted to make. For a Western of this size, the budget of only $400,000 was very tight. There were many problems with the process. Andre de Toth's personal problems sometimes made it hard for him to make decisions on set because of things like snowstorms that slowed down shooting. Ryan also had pneumonia and had to miss a week of shooting because of it. These problems could have ruined a worse movie, but Day of the Outlaw made it through them all. Ryan's effort was one of the best of his career, even though there were problems. He looked tired because you could see it in his eyes. It looked like a man who had been pushed to the edge but wouldn't break. Ryan put a lot of himself into the role, and it showed. It had an effect that lasted long after the movie was over. Making Day of the Outlaw was very stressful, though it cost Ryan something. The hard work on the shoot, the harsh weather, and his illness all made his health worse. It was already hard enough that Detoth decided at the last minute to switch sites from indoor scenes to faraway outdoor scenes. Ryan was worn out from the physical demands of the part and the growing stress on set. Even though the movie was great, it was clear that it had pushed him too far. Later, Jordan, who wrote the story, thought about what Day of the Outlaw might have been like if they had more time and money. But despite its flaws, 
The movie is often thought of as one of the most powerful and moody westerns ever made, and a big part of that is because of how Ryan played. When the movie first came out, it got mixed reviews. Some critics liked how tense and moody it was, while others didn't like how sad it was. But over time, Day of the Outlaw has become a cult favorite known for its stark beauty and performances that people will never forget. Robert Ryan's work started to change in the 1960s. He tried his hand at TV, like a lot of artists did at the time. Ryan didn't want to be tied down to a long-running series, though. He wasn't the type to remain in the same job for years on end. Ryan was afraid that being the lead in a TV show would put him in a box, so he did everything he could to escape that. He once said, Sure, I could make a million or so in a series, but I'd be Sidewinder Sam for the rest of my life, he did, however, have some memorable TV roles. In the TV show Screen Director's Playhouse, he played Abraham Lincoln for the first time. He also showed up in Western collections because he was in episodes of Zane Grey Theater and Wagon Train. In all of these, Ryan made it clear why he didn't want to become a regular on the show. He was in charge of every scene and made the other actors look weak without even trying. It's likely that his next Western, The Canadians 1961, didn't do well because it had the same unrealistic quality. The movie, which was directed by Burt Kennedy, was a Western about a Mountie that didn't have the same magic as its American peers. Ryan played a tough Mountie in the movie, but it went very slowly. There was nothing exciting or interesting about the story, and Ryan looked like he wasn't really into it for the first time. It was clear he was bored with the part, it was like he knew it wasn't worth his time. It's not a surprise that The Canadians is one of Ryan's least memorable westerns, but just when it looked like his western career was coming to an end, Ryan got a supporting part in The Professionals in 1966. The movie was about a group of hired guns sent to Mexico to free a woman who was being held captive. It was directed by his close friend Richard Brooks, along with Lee Marvin, Burt Lancaster, and Woody Strode. Ryan played a horse expert on the team. Ryan's part wasn't the most important, but his quiet performance fit right in with the rest of the cast. The movie was a hit, and Ryan's performance wasn't as big as Marvin and Lancaster's, but he gave the whole group a sense of stability. Ryan got another small part the next year, this time in John Sturgis's Hour of the Gun, which came out in 1967. The movie said it was based on the real story of Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday after the OK. At best, it was unclear how accurate the history was. Ryan played the tough cowboy Ike Clanton, who goes up against James Garner's character Earp. Even though the story wasn't based on real events, Ryan did a good job playing Clanton. He brought his normal level of intensity to the role, giving a character who could have been a one-note bad guy more depth. He did make a good western, but this wasn't it. It wasn't even great in its own right. Not long after that, Ryan had a small role in Custer of the West, a movie that didn't do much to help his late career western resume. The movie, which starred Robert Shaw as the famous General Custer, and was directed by Robert Syed Mack, was long and, to be honest, boring. Ryan played a deserter named Mulligan, but the part wasn't really important to the story. Like, Ryan wasn't really into the role he was just reading his lines without the fire he normally brought to the screen. Also, the writing wasn't helpful. The movie was hard to watch because the conversation was all over the place and it ran too long. It was clear at this point that not every Western would be a winner. There were, however, times when even the great Robert Ryan had to make a turkey. Along with the rise of the Italian Western type in the late 1960s, a lot of Western stars went to Spain. For his part, Ryan felt the pull too. He was in the 1968 movie A Minute to Pray, A Second to Die, a spaghetti Western that didn't quite work. Ryan played Governor Lem Carter of New Mexico, but the movie wasn't memorable and wasn't even close to being as good as his other spy movies. But just when it looked like Ryan's Western days were over, he got one of his most famous parts in Sam Peckinpah's 1969 movie The Wild Bunch. Ryan was almost 60 years old at this point, and his act had a new depth because of it. The Wild Bunch was about a group of old criminals who were trying to stay alive in a world that was moving on without them. Ryan was Deke Thornton, a bounty hunter who used to be a criminal and was hired to find his old friends. He looked great in the part. It's rough, complicated, and full of sorrow. The movie was all about guys who were past their prime and trying to find their place in a world that didn't need them anymore. Ryan really did a great job as Thornton, sharing the screen with greats like William Holden and Ernest Borgnine. Of course, there was drama on every movie set, and The Wild Bunch was no different. There were rumors that Ryan and director Sam Peckinpah had a fight over billing. But it's more likely that Ryan and the rest of the group were annoyed by Peckinpah's bad behavior on set. There are many stories about how Peckinpah swore at the cast and crew. During one scene, Ryan said he was going to punch the director, and his co-stars Holden and Borgnine didn't take long to join in. Even though there was a lot of tension behind the scenes, The Wild Bunch was a masterpiece, and Ryan's acting as Thornton gave the movie's already heavy themes even more weight. 
Ryan played one last part in Lawmen, 1971, directed by Michael Winner. This was the last Western he would play. Even though it had a lot of big names in it, like Burt Lancaster and Lee J. Cobb, the movie was not very good in the end. That movie felt cheap and stuck in the 1970s, not at all like the classic Westerns Ryan was known for. The writing was also not very good. It was clear that the movie wasn't as good as his best work, even though he did a good job as a lazy neighborhood marshal. Even so, Ryan was able to rise above the material, showing once more that he could deliver even in a bad movie. By the time Lawman got out of jail, Ryan already knew he had lymph gland cancer that could not be cured. He kept working, though, showing the same strength that had made his life and business what they were. In one of his last talks, he talked about his life and said, I've had a good shot at life. He died in July 1973 and was remembered for his unforgettable performances. Even more so in the Western style that had shaped so much of his work. There was no stopping Robert Ryan. He could play both evil baddies and heroes who were torn between emotions. He had some great roles in Westerns, but he also had some bad ones. This made him one of the best actors in the genre. He may have lost a lot of money on Day of the Outlaw, but it shows what a great actor he was. Never-ending, dedicated, and memorable.